the um, imaging in the diagnosis of acute stroke. Uh, like Tafail said, I'm one of his uh, diagnostic colleagues at uh, Leeds. And as you know, uh, stroke is a clinical syndrome, so the radiology is an adjunct to the clinical picture. So the, the role of hyperacute imaging is really to see if we can identify ischemic change to support the clinical uh, diagnosis, to exclude mimics, and also to um, exclude hemorrhage, which may have a bearing on ongoing management. It allows us to assess the intra and extracranial arterial vasculature, and also we can do some perfusion imaging, so we can look at the at-risk um, area of brain parenchyma, so we can look at the infarct core, and also the potentially salvageable area, the penumbra. 80% of stroke um, relates to ischemic injury, and of those, 75% occur in the middle cerebral artery territory. When we talk about ischemia, it could be arterial or venous, it could be embolic, or it could be a hypoperfusion phenomenon. And really, the key role of imaging is to make early diagnosis so that we can go on and get uh, prompt, appropriate treatment. The detection on the CT, though, can be difficult in the very early stages because a lot of the signs are very subtle. And uh, Joanna Wardlaw and colleagues did a, a systematic review, and they found the sensitivity for detection of early ischemic change on CT to be quite low, actually, at 66%. But with time and observer experience, the rate of detection improved. So here's a case. That there's no clinical scenario here. Uh, I'm not going to give you the details, but can you pick up the early stroke on this study? I think someone's got the box of tricks, so you can speak into that. <laughs> it probably on the right side, I feel that there is some grey-white matter differentiation. Uh, well, that's the only thing, and loss of insular ribbon as well. Okay, so and uh, so laterally, or do you think in the deep areas, or so laterally, more laterally, more in laterally. The... Okay, and so um, anatomically, this is the uh, chordate head. This is the lenticular nucleus, and. Um, so this is the area that's lost. So if you see normally, the chordate will be the same um, attenuation as the putamen because it's the same structure. So uh, chordate putamen uh, uh, histologically would be uh, the same, and so uh, radiologically would have similar imaging characteristics, which is bright on CT. Here we've lost this. So this is early MCA perforator ischemia, and this is just uh, a further slice on this patient. So again, you can see the bright lenticular nucleus outlined by the white matter tracks, and here it's just homogenous. It's homogenous because we've got the breakdown, we've got cell swelling because of the damage to the uh, potassium sodium pump. So we get um, a swelling of the cell and then reduced movement and reduced differentiation between adjacent structures. And that's the delayed imaging there. So that was the actual infarct area. So the chordate was actually preserved, although on the initial imaging it looked like it was slightly reduced. So how about this one, Mike? Why don't you pass the box to someone else? And any comments on this one? Again, actually in clinical practice, it's the history that ties into the imaging. But you know, sometimes we don't get a relevant history. Um, is there anything on here? So again, we're looking for subtle signs. And it's likely we're going to be talking about MCA, given that it's the most uh, common. I think the only thing I can really point to is the sulca in the left temporal are a bit less prominent. Okay. Otherwise, yeah. Yeah, and, and so that's a good, so again, <laughs> another, so that's good, so um, that's a good secondary sign that you can get some local swelling, you lose a soul size, you get sulcal effacement, and here actually we can see the chordate, we can see the lenticular nucleus, as we come lateral we come to the insular cortex, and here if you now compare, so the good thing about neuroimaging is often as a comparative, so if we go to the other side, we can see the bright cortex. Here it's lost. This is a insular ribbon. And how about on this one? Pass the box. <laughs> so, any thoughts on that? And this is a bit of repetition now. So, any thoughts on this? Yeah, 
We've got to use the box because we've got it. So everyone can hear. Uh, right side empty areas. Yeah. There is a nozzle into that rear bin. Okay, so maybe the engine yes. ribbon. How about the lenticular nucleus? Do you think you can see that as well as the other yes. side? I think you've lost it as well, haven't you? And sometimes, if you're not sure, a, a, a good technique is to just try and what we call narrow the window. So make the, the grayscale a, a little bit uh, darker, if you like. So this is what happens when we alter the, the windows on this. And I'd argue that probably now stands out quite a lot more than it did previously. So you can see we've definitely lost the lenticular nucleus, whereas it's very bright on the uh, contralateral side. And at 24 hours, this is the completion of the stroke. So there's no doubt that there's an infarct there. So we've got the uh, subtle brain parenchymal changes, but then, as Tafels talked about, the vessels, they need close interrogation on the CT imaging. So this is a non-contrast study, and we have uh, paired structures. So we've got the internal carotid cones up, and as you've seen, it goes laterally into the sylvian fissure. So we're going to have one coming out here and one here. So there's not many things that we see on CT which are bright. You know, we see calcium, hemorrhage, protonace protonaceous material. So would you agree that we've got something that's bright in this area? It's not hemorrhage because it's not dependent, so it's not layering against the brain parenchyma. So this is in a tubular structure. So this is a good long length of thrombus within the proximal MCA. If there was any doubt on, on that, or even if there wasn't doubt, there's actually probably benefit at this point in doing a CT angiography to uh, further define this. But you can get more peripheral clot formation or visualization on a CT imaging. So the MCA comes laterally through the sylvian fissure and then comes back on itself and travels back and superiorly through the sylvian fissure. And so can, can you all spot the abnormality here? So we've got right, so now we're into sort of M2 territory. So this is an M2 thrombus and people talk about the dot sign. And then we see that and then we think, well, is there any further evidence to support ischemia within that hemisphere? And actually probably there is the insular cortex. We're just getting very superior aspects. It's not quite as uh, well defined as on the other side. We've got mass effects, as you mentioned before. So we've lost the definition of the sylvian fissure and the basal nuclei are less well defined than the contralateral side. So it all adds up. And sometimes it can be uh, really bright. So this is really bright. This is calcific density. And in this scenario, this was someone who'd had an aortic uh, valve repair and uh, it was heavily calcified at the time of procedure, immediately post procedure. The patient had nominal uh, aphasia. Um, this was delayed imaging uh, the same day, uh, showing the area of infarction distal to the thrombotic occlusion from the heavily calcified embolus. As you move into the posterior circulation, the detection of intra arterial abnormality becomes a little more tricky because you haven't got a paired structure. So, with the MCAs, you've got the other side to compare against and see if there's any convincing intraluminal thrombus. Here, sometimes actually dependent on a good history and a, you know, close inspection and consideration of it because actually, sadly, is a diagnosis made too late or retrospectively. So this is someone who has got posterior circulation symptomatology. You know where the bacillus sits immediately anterior to the brain stem. So this is this structure. And if we see that, then we should look elsewhere for signs of posterior circulation ischemia. So can you see any signs of it on this study? Right PCA. Yeah, right PCA. So we've lost a grey-white definition in this occipital lobe. So it all fits in with a posterior circulation infarct. Unfortunately, in that scenario, that one was missed. And this is the sequelae of it. So gross brainstem ischemia, mass effect, fourth ventricular effacement, this was going to be a movie demonstrating a CT angiography. I don't believe it's running, unfortunately, some incompatibility between the systems. But it's a reminder to say about the acquisition. You need a good caliber um, cannula within the antecubital fossa. So probably the ideal would be a green cannula as a minimum, because you're looking for a flow rate of about five mils or four and a half mils a second. You can use pink. If you use a pink cannula, you're down to about a three mil th flow rate and your pacification of the arterial system is going to be less good. So the bigger the cannula, the greater the flow rate, the better the quality of the angiography will be. 
How about this one? Who can see the pathology here? Okay, then. That's good because that one is normal. <laughs> um, so we'll have a look at more um, images now with clinical scenarios. This is a teenager. He played rugby on a Saturday afternoon. He took a really uh, severe tackle and had a headache following. Next morning, his parents found him collapsed on the toilet and he was brought to A&E. So uh, this is the initial CT slice I'm going to show you. So but we're low down in the posterior fossa mm -hmm. and uh, just see if you can identify any possible pathology there. There is a possible habitant to get larger, but it's not, it's just, not uh, prominent. I, I'm yeah, okay, so you want to see a, a bit more, don't you? A bit more, yeah. Mm -hmm. Okay, so we're going to move it. The problem just sat here is we're, we're right on the back of the bony structure of the yeah. glibus, and so you can get some partial volumeing, and you, you mm -hmm. may not be certain, especially if you're imaging at five millimeters, which is what we standardly do, you know, five millimeters brain acquisition. So if you didn't have CT angiography at this point, what you could do is ask the radiographers to reconstruct it. So you can get volumetric imaging from that. So you could get them to reconstruct it at sub-millimeter, like 0.6 millimeters, get a volume of data. Then you can look at it multiplanar, look at it in the sagittal and the coronal plane. Do you need a radiologist for that, or can you do it yourself on the computer? Well, if, if you get a radiographer to do it, you can ask them to send the full sagittal and coronal data set, and then you'd have it all on your systems, and you wouldn't need a radiologist to do that. It's a radiographer. So here we've got up the bazilla, and this is a bazilla tip. And if you want reference, you can go to the distal internal carotid arteries. As the vessel bifurcates into the PCAs, it actually looks to be a normal attenuation, normal signal characteristics. So we, we've said it's possibly uh, abnormality with the basilar artery. So in this, this is exactly what we did. So in this case, we've got volumetric reconstruction. And it does lend some strength to the fact that we, see, we think we see some perceived increased attenuation, so bright signal within the inferior aspect of the basilla. We look at it in another plane, and we're actually we're fairly sure that this does look real. So to take that forward, what would you do next? So CT angiogram, yeah, so they're on table, so we would do a CT angiogram. So this is a CT angiogram. You can see the two vertebral arteries. We're coming up to the confluence, gonna join to make the basilla artery. And what you want to be seeing on the CT angiogram is high attenuation, filling the lumen. So you want bright, luminal, you know, tubular structure. When you get an internal filling defect, this is the suggestion of intraluminal thrombus. So if we look here, normal looking verticals, we come up. At this point, we've lost the signal. We don't see anything that looks anything like a normal artery here. Here's the internal carotid on at the left. As we go distal, we get recanalization of the vessel. So it does look like we've got a proximal uh, thrombosis. Again, we can do multiplanar reconstruction using the, either get them to do it on the CT scanner, or you can do that with software on the uh, pack stations. And you can get these um, 3D images, but it just shows the same imaging, you know, as you've seen on the base data. And in fact, there's more reliability with the base data because these can be windowed, you know, so you can make vessels look wider or narrower depending on how you're using the mouse. So you have to be cautious of uh, putting too much reliability on these 3D imaging. So um, in this scenario, we did confirm that there was a uh, clot and uh, this was a young chap who was uh, reduced uh, GCS, he was intubated and so the decision uh, was made to go for angiography to see uh, what this looked like. Um, this is what the angiography showed. So we've got vertebral injection, and we've got abrupt termination of contrast to pacification. We've got some backfilling of the right vertebral, which is non-dominant. So we've got dominant left side, but no pacification of the distal uh, bacilla. And again, here you can see this filling defect here comes up, so decent volume thrombus and no filling or very little filling distally. So this is a case where clot extraction was attempted and was done successfully. So if we compare the initial angiography to what we have now, we see we have got a pacification of the basilla trunk and of the distal vessels. This is not perfect. There is a filling defect still seen at the base of the basilla artery. In these scenarios, you have to sort of um, 
weigh up the risks and benefits. So the risk of going in again here is you could lose the whole scenario. So you go in, you put another catheter in, and all of a sudden you may have no pacification of the vessels. So here we've got apparent radiographic reperfusion, and so you take this. Would you thrombolize that? IA or in addition to thrombectomy. Yeah, would you be tempted? I, I would have to refer that to my interventional, so I'm a diagnostician, okay. so um, would it be tempted? I mean, I don't, probably not, I think is the answer. Yeah, I think probably not, I think you'd... That's on the time you go, I mean, uh, when you thrombolize the switch, the whole switch is intravenous, so it's a matter of it's a basal or the brain is there. It's just with it, like the longer window and if the clot is there, if with it being there, and if it was within 10 hours, yeah, I mean, would I, you, I, I, would I mean, you be tempted to squirt a bit of TPA? Well, I mean, you don't know the treatment, you might want to get thrombolysis. Yeah. Because uh, you expect to do nothing. Uh, and I think uh, some studies have shown giving thrombolysis up to 12 hours in, in Basler is uh, still okay. The basics registry would give up in 12 hours. Okay, then that's the. Um, so this is another case, and this is just to show that sometimes it can be really subtle. So again, we've got posterior circulation symptomatology. We identified a basilar artery, so here we're working at five millimeter non-contrast uh, CT slices. And um, can anyone see any pathology at this point? Nothing definite, is there? It's a bit brighter, but... A bit bright there, okay. Yeah, and that, that's what we thought. We thought, is it, is it not? And you know, there's some uncertainty. So actually, there's not much to lose in this scenario by doing the CT angiogram and um, evaluating rather than uh, doing it too late. So here's the CT angiogram. So we've moved up, we're about mid uh, point of the basilar artery coming up. Yeah, okay, so there is intraluminal thrombus there. So it's subtle and it is difficult when you haven't got a paired vessel. So it's about having the clinical suspicion. Any doubt on the imaging, I think reconstructed, you know, very thin reconstructions again here would have been useful. And if there's doubt, CT angiogram. As we've said, CT imaging can be quite subtle in terms of demonstrating the extent of infarction. So can anyone uh, see the infarct on this study? Okay, the is there, is there a less left uh, yeah, so we've yeah. got an M2 dot, so we look at we've got thrombus here. And when you see the thrombus, then you work backwards from the thrombus yeah. and you think, well, how much of the... Yeah. Um, and we start working and we say, well, actually the circle pattern is le a lot less well-defined than it is on a contralateral side. So actually it could be quite a large territory infarct. Um, and this is where diffusion weighted imaging is really the radiologist's best friend because this takes about one minute to do and it really makes it very easy to define. It could be picked up on the CT, but the MR um, does define it more readily. And uh, this is the ADC map con confirming the um, infarct. There's a role sometimes for diffusion as well. So the, the diffusion and diffusion mismatch is therefore going to demonstrate the potentially salvageable areas. So the diffusion area is suggestive, but not exclusive of the infarct core. The reduced diffusion, the hypoperfusion, is the at risk, and the mismatch is a potentially salvageable area, and that can help guide ongoing management decisions. And we can do CT perfusion as well. So again, you can see here, a large territory infarct confirmed with a greatly reduced perfusion on the CT. So here's someone with um, sudden isolated diplopia and ataxia, and the CT was felt to be normal, and they had um, MR imaging. So I'm going to show you some limited MR slices. So we've got mainly, the main finding is diplopia. So uh, we've got some axial T2 imaging, really sort of focusing on the brain stem as the area of interest. Anyone see any abnormality in the brainstem on that slice? Possible suggestion of, I've seen left. Maybe. Uh, how about on that diffusion one? On DWS, almost. 
So on the, on the DWI, it, it, it's obvious. It's obvious when it's highlighted. Yeah, yeah. yeah. So, um, so these are five millimeter slice thickness, and uh, that was the only suggestion I saw on this imaging. I thought, oh, is there something there? So just um, para paramedian. And where there's doubt, this is again a role for more dedicated imaging. So you get your radiologist or radiographer to do some thinner imaging through it, just to confirm. So we did some three millimeter slice thickness. And three millimeter imaging of the uh, brainstem at DWI clearly demonstrates the uh, paramedian infarct. If you see bilateral infarction, it can still be arterial. And there's the artery of Percheron, which you may or may not be familiar with. So the artery of Percheron is a um, common perforator, dominant branch coming off the P1. And it's going to branch and give perforators to both aspects of the thalami. So here we've got subtle reduced attenuation, which is more apparent on this CT study, confirmed on the MR with diffusion restriction. So bilateral thalamic, it can be single arterial territory, which is personal. The other thing to think of is a venous insult, but often with venous injury, you get a lot of swelling. Not everything that restricts is um, infarction. Here's bilateral, sort of lateral thalamic going into the uh, lenticular nuclei, uh, T2 signal change, which shows diffusion restriction, but as does the area at the back, so that one was actually lymphoma. So in addition to doing CT angiography, uh, there are, um, as you know, benefits in MR angiography, and also there still remains a role for ultrasound. So this is a patient that's got a dissection of the right internal carotid artery, and it's shown on all three modalities. With the CT imaging, one of the limitations is the bony artifacts and where the defect seems to be near a osseous uh, foramina, actually you might be better doing MR to uh, further define it. So here, here's a 33 year old with neck pain and dizziness and CT was felt to be normal. And in terms of where we are, I think it's the vertebral arteries that we need to pay attention to. So you've got a dominant left, I'll draw your attention to the left vertebral artery. And we're looking for a well-defined rounded lumen uh, coming uh, all the way. And as we start coming up, this lumen is slightly irregular. And again here, if you look at the other side, it's non-dominant, but very well-rounded. This is irregular. And um, we can reconstruct those images. This is CT angiography going through. And it's quite difficult actually on this because of all the bony artifact. But there's the abnormality over there. So if you do it on MR, which is so much easier to define, it takes away all the um, bony overlap. And we can see this is a dissection with a pseudo aneurysm, M3 segment. Here's a, a chap who's got occasional visual loss over the last two weeks, mainly in the morning, and he had some temporal discomfort and a question, oh, he had it clinically left hornets. So the CT imaging was felt to be normal. So again, just orientating you, this is common carotid, common carotid. Anyone think we've seen any pathology? There's a reduced yes. lumen on the right, left side. Left yeah, side. this yes. lumen, okay, so here's the right. Lumen here on the left is greatly diminished, and it looks actually like there's a circumferential rim, almost sort of soft tissue density surrounding it. This is the parasagittal imaging, and you can see probably a flap, and then we've got this characteristic sort of rat's tail, sort of tapering of the vessel. So that's what we see when the vessel dissects. If you compare that to the normal side, so normal caliber lumen, which gradually diminishes as it heads up to the vertex. Again, volumetric imaging, but the diagnosis is made on the base data. We went on to do MR imaging on this, and it actually you can see the diagnosis on the first uh, slice that we do. So sometimes, if you think about um, dissection as a role for T1 fat cell imaging, mm -hmm. it's very good at demonstrating intraluminal um, hematoma. So, can you spot the dissection on that, knowing which side? 
we were looking at before. Oops. Okay, right, so it's here. So left all this. So on the fat set, so T1 fat is going to be bright. So we've got rid of it, all the fat, but we're still left with bright material surrounding the lumen here. That's the lumen. And this is within the wall. So this is hematoma, intramural hematoma. Could you just go back one slide before? So do we have a. Yeah. yeah. Confirmed on our geography. Someone else, thunderclap headache, tender scalp. And I think I'm going to give you, uh, so just to confirm on the anatomy, so we've got left internal carotid artery there. This is the styloid process. Internal jugular. Got a vertebral going in at the back, so the V4 segment. And here we've got right internal carotid. So what do you think? Small, 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 Reduced caliber, it's just about coming normal caliber as we go distal. So that again is another dissection. And in this scenario, associated with the pseudoaneurysm as well. Not everything we see that looks like a stroke is a stroke, but we just have to be aware of that and just question what we're looking at. So here, where we still seem to have some preservation of the cortex, and this almost looks like vasogenic edema. And don't be satisfied with your search that you found one area of pathology. Look elsewhere, so we've got pathology that we're drawn to in the right parietal region, but there's probably something going on in the left thalamus. If the patient's still on the table, the radiologist would give contrast and actually see that we've got multifocal abnormality. But just question. It doesn't involve the cortex or it's multifocal. Is it really ischemia or is something else going on? If you have purely cortical infarct, sometimes really there's not that much need to go on and do with the MR because it's, the answer is on the CT, it just gets overlooked. So, can you see the infarct on this? Is it uh, left, it's on the left, uh, yeah, okay. So, in terms of anatomy, so I look for this structure, this is the marginal ramus. The singular, to, or let's just let's call it a bracket. So I find this bracket, I go anterior to that, and this is the central sulcus. Central sulcus doesn't divide along its length. Immediately anterior is the precentral gyrus. Precentral gyrus. So I'm looking for hand motor bulge, and there uh, is the infarct. So we can try that again on these two. So in this patient, which hand is affected? In this patient, tricky at this one. In this one, the left hand, I think it's right hand. Uh, you think? So, um, so marginal ramus, central sulcus. So pre-central gyrus. So right hand motor board, so it's going to be left hand. Yeah. This one is trickier. Not when you've got the diffusion of it. <laughs> Sometimes you can walk past things because you just don't look for what should be there. So here, the fourth ventricle should be a well-defined rounded structure. Mm -hmm. And you can't see it. And then it, if you spot that, you think, well, why is that? Can I see the gray-white differentiation? Well, I can in this hemisphere. Can I spot it here? Maybe not. What about when I go higher up? Mm -hmm. The basal cisterns are partially effaced. So this isn't entirely normal as was considered at the time the patient was discharged. Two days later they come in, the infarct that was there on the presentation scan has shown maturation, the fourth ventricle is further effaced and now there is evolving hydrocephalus and the MR confirms the vertebral dissection and the large territory of the part. Just a couple more cases. So again looking for subtle signs because of the large, obvious infarcts are easy to spot. 
Here we have a CSF space coming out from the base of the fort, so the foramen of Lushka. We see it on the left, we don't see it on the right, but this could easily be walked past because it looks like the same signal intensity as the brain parenchyma. When we do the MR, it does stand out a bit more uh, pronounced, but it's, there's definitely something there, it's rounded, and there is, uh, this is a vertebral artery, and there seems to be a vessel here. We do the CT angiogram, and it confirms that this is a pike or aneurysm. So, final case, um, this is a young lady, had a three week history of headache. Uh, this is the actual uh, request card, so features of raised intracranial pressure, episode of confusion, no head injury. This is the first slice. Anyone see anything abnormal on that? Yeah, there is a high pore density on the right side. Right. On the left side. On the left, left. okay, side. yeah. Okay, and this, this girl is 30. But as we go up, the rest of the uh, cerebellum looks okay. The scan was reported normal. Mm -hmm. In retrospect, it's not normal, and that needs further, you know, she's come in with posterior circulation symptomatology, so she needs at the CT angiogram, or she needs an MR and an MR angiogram to further evaluate this. But sometimes the signs can be subtle and things can be overlooked. So anyway, she went off to New York for her 30th birthday. And she spent the five days in New York in bed. And she came back in. Uh, she came back in on Monday morning. And uh, went straight to a &E at Leeds and had repeat imaging. And again, you're looking for subtle things. So this wasn't there on the prior study. Neither were these small areas of low attenuation superiorly. The person who looked at that thought maybe inflammatory, but actually if you go back to the prior MR, it's in the prior CT, it's unlikely that we're going to get new inflammatory lesions over the course of four or five days. And a stuttering pathology, this sounds like this is evolving stuttering posterior circulation infarction. We do the CT angiogram, look at the bazilla. Where's the bazilla? It's quite Diagnosis? Zillar artery thrombus. So, I think the message is to have a high index of suspicion. I have a low threshold for advanced or further imaging. Um, so, there we are. Thank you very much.